Thank you. Um, so I'm an assistant professor in Earth and Atmospheric Sciences uh, on the atmospheric science side. Not that there's anything wrong with Earth. It's great, I like Earth. But I've um, been here for about two years, and the thing that I've learned um, really from interacting with the community that we serve, we're doing science with a purpose, is that all of my training as an atmospheric scientist, climate scientist, I was at the National Center for Atmospheric Research before I came here, follows a paradigm that I think needs to shift. And it follows a paradigm where the scientific research community develops their best products, their best forecasts, their best tools, and then essentially hands them out like on stone tablets to user groups, potential stakeholders, and says, this is, this is the best. And sometimes that information, those products, get picked up, and sometimes they don't. And what I'm very interested in doing is turning that paradigm around, that framework around a little bit, or mostly, really, to be able to interact uh, with the people who are making decisions about what to plant, where to plant, how to adapt to and respond to climate change in near real time, and then using their needs as a motivator, as a guideline for areas of research. Um, so I'll get back into that, but I did end up shifting around my whole talk um, this morning. I actually redid my entire talk this morning because I got an email from Allison Chatterchan, who's the director for Chica, the Cornell Institute for Climate Change and Agriculture, uh, with this link in it. Godzilla El Nino, now being called strongest in recorded history. And it's like everything I like, all in one, all in one title. You've got science fiction. You've got El Nino, which is a seasonal phenomena. It's probably one of the only seasonal phenomena that we have pretty good predictive skill uh, to be able to use for impacts and for agriculture. It's got climate change sort of implied in there, strongest in recorded history. So I actually wanted to just talk about this a little bit and the basis for this type of a statement or this type of a prediction. Um, Godzilla also is a great term because, you know, Godzilla comes out of the ocean, like El Nino comes out of the ocean. I wish I'd come up with that term myself. That, yeah, well, <laughs> that, that's the downside. Um, so, to, so to do seasonal prediction, to make meaningful forecasts, out a month, three months, a few months in advance, you need one of two tools. You need either a statistical model, which is going to relate variables that have been observed, measured in the past, um, significant correlations or covariances amongst those variables to make some sort of probabilistic forecast about the future based on historical estimates. It's not obvious that, that approach is wrong or has more limitations than the alternative approach. But the alternative approach, the one that's being most aggressively pursued by the scientific community, is to make those forecasts dynamically. In other words, to try to simulate the flow of the ocean and the atmosphere in realistic, incredible ways to get at the signal, the information that's embedded within the, chi the chaotic dynamical system that is the Earth and atmosphere. Um, to do it even on seasonal timescales, even past about 10 days or five days, you actually need a global model. You need to simulate, in some capacity, energy and mass in the oceans and atmosphere globally because the information relative to, relevant to you today might have originated halfway around the hemisphere or might have originated in the, the Pacific Ocean. It might be the Godzilla El Nino is the most relevant thing for this winter in the Northeast. So you actually do need to have a global model. This is your typical global model diagram. So you can imagine that the atmosphere is broken apart into these grid cells, hundreds, thousands of grid cells in the horizontal, and a few dozen vertically. Same kind of thing is done with the, with the ocean. These types of models are what are used to simulate climate change out through the end of this century, and they're being retooled, and they've been retooled in recent years to address the seasonal prediction problem. It's very cutting edge stuff. So the results that I'm going to show today, I mean, they barely even count as results. This is still very much um, at the, the forefront of our understanding of the potential predictability of climate. In fact, the data set that I've been analyzing is, has only been publicly available since March of this year. 
So we're really on the cusp of, of the sort of the state of the art, best seasonal forecast products that are available, and we just don't know how good they are. And this is where it's really great to have um, a group like this and to have a meeting like this where we can talk with stakeholders and people who are making decisions about what to do on the farm to be able to incorporate into our analysis of those data sets the needs of the user groups. So this is climate modeling, seasonal forecasting 101. Say you've got some variable that you're interested in, temperature. And you've got some scenario, let's say it's climate change, where you increase greenhouse gas concentrations into the future and temperatures go up. And you do this once with one model, and it's kind of analogous. Our Digitana, who gave a talk yesterday, makes this analogy. I think it's a really good one. It's kind of analogous if you go to different travel websites, you know, MapQuest or Google, and you estimate travel times between Ithaca, New York, and Boston. It's going to give you a different answer. Right? There's different assumptions built into the different softwares, software programs that you use to estimate travel times, and there's different assumptions built into different models. And so what we do in climate, seasonal forecasting, weather forecasting, is we do ensembles. We generate a whole suite, a whole population, a whole family of different model simulations, and then look at the average, because it's assumed, it's thought, that the average of those different simulations tells us the most meaningful part of the actual climate system. So this little animation is just going to show a bunch of different simulations of this temperature curve, but with slightly different initial conditions. This is like the butterfly effect. Butterfly flaps its wings in Brazil, and you know, it rains three days later in upstate New York. Um, so here we go. And each one of these has started slightly differently. You end up with a spread. You end up with variability. This is akin to when they show the hurricane forecast for Sandy, when they're showing the hurricane forecast for Sandy 10 days out and it just looked like spaghetti strewn up all over the map. It's a forecaster's nightmare. Some of them are going up all the way into Canada. Other ones are curving further south. And a few were making landfall where Hurricane Sandy actually did make landfall. So you get this spread from different models, different estimates, with different assumptions based in. And you look at the average. And so for climate change, the average of all the different models is warming, which is not surprising. But in reality, the face of climate change, as it comes down the barrel at us, isn't going to look like the average of all these different models. It's going to be one of these. And it's that one realization that unfolds that matters most to all of us who inhabit this planet. If you don't have another nice control planet that we can compare, it'd be great if we had like 100 different Earths at the same distance from the sun orbiting around, where we could look at variability in a really controlled scientific sense. But we can't, so we have models instead. This is a result from a climate change experiment. I'll get back into the seasonal prediction stuff. There's a lot of similarities between how seasonal prediction and climate change is done. But this is climate change, looking out uh, towards the end of this century for different scenarios of greenhouse gas emissions by human activities. And at the high end, these are for the global averages. At the high end, you get a whole heck of a lot of warming, four degrees Celsius. And somewhere in the middle, you have the range and this is an ensemble average, so the interesting relevant variability has been stripped out, and we're only left with the forced response, the influence of rising greenhouse gases. And this is very typical of climate science to show and to use this kind of a curve. But it's not very meaningful because this is something a, a uh, grower from near Seneca, I think in Seneca County, told me when I gave a talk similar to this about a year or two years ago. I don't care about next, nothing doesn't care. Like, okay, I have kids, I care about next century. But <laughs> what's happening by, by 2050, by 2100, isn't going to influence the decisions I make today about you know, how to allocate resources this season. And this really stuck with me. I and mean, I thought, well, you know, okay, well, what we need to be investing in, and what I'm working on, and what our collaborators are working on, is not the climate change problem. We expect that during this century, we're going to see a whole heck of a lot of warming. But as that happens, what we're interested in, what I'm interested in, is being able to see the hazards, particularly the agriculture, as they come at us in a sense of brightening the headlights. Right? The road is, is going to be you know, determined by a combination of human activity and the dynamics of the climate system itself. And we're headed down that road. 
And sure, we can shape that road, we can reduce emissions, we can, we can do all kinds of policy-oriented things to try to change the path that we take. But I'm interested in brighter headlights, being able to see the hazards as they come at us. And in particular, the kinds of hazards or the kinds of maybe even opportunities, but the events in the annual cycle that are thresholds, that are times, days of the year, that when we cross them, we do certain things. Now, I'm not a farmer, but I ride a bike. And I ride a mountain bike in the winter, and at some point in the spring, I switch over to my road bike. And that day of the year when I switch over to my skinny tired road bike, which I'd fall over on in the winter, changes from one year to the next year because in one year it might be a warm March, 2012, very warm March. And then there was a freeze event that caused a lot of damage. 2013, 2014 were kind of average. Uh, 2015 was also average, slightly cool. So the day of year when I switched over to my road bike this year was, I think, towards the end of March. Um, there's other decisions that people make that we expect to make at a certain part of the year. And predicting that window of time in a seasonal forecasting sense, predicting when we should get out into the field or when we should, um, you know, if we're going to use some, some treatments, that's a question that has received very little attention in the climate and meteorological sciences and one that I think is really important to ask. Especially on these time horizons, 10 days to 10 years. So 10 days to 10 years, what can we see coming at us a little before it happens. And there's some opportunity, there's some reason to be hopeful that there's potential predictability, at least on the 10 day time horizon, and maybe all the way out to the 10 year horizon in some areas. But whether or not that's actually relevant to decision makers remains to be determined. And that's part of the conversation, the dialogue that's critical for getting this right. I'm going to show you now the state of the art, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, this map is from the latest and greatest, best data set of seasonal predictions that's available. This is a compilation of about a dozen different models, different software frameworks used to do seasonal predictions. Each of them has done about a dozen or so individual simulations. And the reliability or the skill of those simulations is used to assess whether or not anything meaningful or credible can be said from that whole archive. For August, September, October of this year, so just looking out the three-month average from now. This is hot off the press, downloaded this morning. This is precipitation. So a little wetter maybe on average, this is in units of millimeters per day, which by the way I understand is not a great meaningful unit to try to communicate with, and I, this is why I want to have the conversation that we're having at this conference. So what should we be putting in terms of units um, on these kinds of bars that we make? If you're in the central sort of Rocky Mountains, maybe this is useful here, sort of Midwest or Missouri, you might pay attention to this. If you are interested in imports, if you buy grain from other parts of the country, this could be a useful map in some scenarios, in some seasons, because you might be able to anticipate what parts of the country are going to get hit harder and what might be the impacts on crop prices for you, how much you should try to grow regionally versus import during, the, during a given season. As these tools become better and better, as we evaluate them and assess them and get feedback on what we should be trying to do, I expect these products will improve. So really, we're at the ground level now. As Mike Hoffman said, there's really only one way to go with these, with these predictions. That's precipitation. The next one is temperature, which is a little better. Same season, August, September, October. Here we are. So expect, with some medium degree of confidence, a warmer than average 
what, late summer, early fall? And if you're in the West, or if you're sensitive to prices in the West, this could be really useful information. And the rest of the continent is either not skillful or white just means average. So Arizona, where I did my graduate studies, looks average. So super duper hot, because it's average. This is going one more three month window ahead. September, October, November. So this is really getting into the fall months. And there's still some skill all the way out into the fall. For a lot of the continent. And for up here, it's looking like kind of a warm fall. Now, is it warm and wet or warm and dry? We don't have that kind of, we can't make that kind of a statement yet. But it looks warmer than average. And once we move out to the winter, the skill, the reliability of these forecasts disappears for our region. But not for the Southwest. And the reason that we have probably, I would say, more confidence in the seasonal forecasts this year is that there's this thing called El Nino happening, unfolding. Everybody's sort of heard about El Nino in the news, I assume. It's a Godzilla El Nino. Um, so let me explain why when there's an El Nino event happening, we should take it seriously. The physical processes that give rise to an El Nino event, the actual changes in the energy balance and circulation of the ocean and the atmosphere, those physical processes are reasonably well characterized, reasonably well understood, and reasonably well predicted in a theoretical sense. Normally in the Pacific Ocean, you have this gradient of colder waters in the east, upwelling waters from the deeper ocean, colder in the east, and warmer in the west. And that gradient of warm to cold, cold to warm, drives trade winds across the ocean like this. And so out in the western Pacific, when it's normal, it's average conditions, you typically have these big anvils of huge, you know, 10 kilometer more, six, seven miles of convection, just shooting up day after day, week after week, month after month. And that's normal. And it gets hotter, and it gets, gets hot in the boreal summer, and this is all just cooking, and it's rainy out in Indonesia. There's a monsoon in Southeast Asia, and that's the average. And it's wet in the west, and it's cooler and drier out in the east. And it drives the trade winds and it drives the circulation. When we have an El Nino event, that whole system, the coupled system of the ocean and the atmosphere, breaks down and it reorganizes. And when it breaks down and it reorganizes, the warm water kind of sloshes out into the central Pacific. And that's what we're seeing here, this anomaly that we're seeing, is the average change predicted by the models, but perfectly consistent with what's been observed in the past during an El Nino event. It's this disappearance, the suppression of the normally cold waters by the warm water sloshing out into the central Pacific. So that part of the system, the coupled part of the system, the physical processes, we understand and we have a lot of confidence. I think NOAA is saying officially of, of, of about a week ago, there's a 90% 90 90 chance of El Nino persisting through the fall, and an 80% chance that it'll persist all the way through winter. It's a very high level of confidence that NOAA is putting in to the prediction of El Nino. And it's because not only do they understand the physical processes, it's also understood that the ocean just can't reorganize itself very quickly. So when it's stuck in this kind of a state, it's going to stay there for at least a few weeks and months. So that's a source of potential predictability. And if you live in the West Coast, if you live in California, or Arizona, where they've been just a horrible drought. This is good news. It means it's probably going to be a wetter than average fall. Um, might be able to recharge some of those reservoirs and aquifers that have been depleted with the drought of the last four or five years. 
But that's actually a second order effect. And that's a little bit, that, that's something that should be a little bit troubling because it's not, it's not the physical system anymore that's changing. It's the effects of the system that we understand. So when you get this sloshing of warm water and the movement of the convection into the Central Pacific, it actually sort of pulls the jet stream, the storm tracks, closer to the equator. And when that happens, you get more moisture further south, so it gets a little bit drier. And once we get across the continent to where we are in the Great Lakes in the Northeast, the effects are even further afield. So El Nino, despite the fact that we put a lot of confidence in our predictions of the phenomena, doesn't give us a whole lot in terms of its impacts in general. It gives us some in the southwest, but out here, that deteriorates. And the next step, which hasn't even been assessed yet, is the impacts of the actual weather variations themselves. So this is where, gee, if we had this kind of a prediction, um, say in the spring, and we could make a, you know, once we get to, let's say, January, tune in back, back in, in January, um, we'll be able to look out reasonably well to March, presumably. And we'll be able to say something about whether it's expected to be still in El, El Nino in March or not. And if it still is, that could probably mean a lot warmer temperatures. Now, a warmer three-month average could be good news or bad, bad news. Like if you're a grower and you want to, or you want to get in the field early and plant, that could be good news. Unless you get something like 2012, where it was warm, everything came out of dormancy early, and then we had just an average, regular old climatological freeze event in April that cost half a billion in Michigan alone in agricultural damage. Now, could we have forecasted 2012 going not using El Nino, but using other sources of potential predictability, going all the way back into January? And the answer is yes, no, maybe. 2012 was driven by weather patterns. The early part was driven by patterns that could have been predicted as early as January. So there's like a two-month lead time for saying it's an early spring, but then predicting that frost event, no, maybe a few days. So predicting the damages from something like a, a, a late freeze or an average freeze, that's a long way off. Predicting the averages, we're getting there, now, predicting the thresholds, making seasonal forecasts of the thresholds, which are related to the averages, um, is probably doable on the near term. We can probably say, within the next year or two, we expect this spring to be early because of these reasons. And if it's early, we might also use a historical perspective to say there's a higher risk of, of frost damage. That being said, the Godzilla El Nino, as it's unfolding, um, might, might, be completely, might be a completely new beast altogether. It might be a new kind of event. And the reason I want to bring this up is because last year, uh, I teach tropical meteorology. So in the spring of 2014, we did our El Nino chapter, and it looked like a slam dunk. Spring, everything was unfolding. The water was sloshing into the Central Pacific. Um, the, the atmosphere looked like it was responding. 2014, 2015, that winter had everything going for it for a big El Nino. They were, gonna, they were calling it, the, this is going to be the El Nino of the century. I, I don't think they used the word Godzilla El Nino in 2014, but they could have. People were in the spring of 2014 very confident that a big El Nino was unfolding. And yet, it was a total dud. And there wasn't much of an El Nino at all. There was a technical El Nino. The, the temperatures in the Central Pacific got warm enough for long enough to qualify as El Nino, but that was it. The impacts downstream were virtually negligible. Uh, I was in California in December, and one of the big air, active areas of research I have going is, um, is drought and drought in the southwest. And so, of course, I wanted to go and drive around and take pictures of the drought. Um, and fortunately, for Californians, it had just rained. So it ruined my pictures um, because it was green. It was beautiful and green. It just rained. These big, and this is like signaling this big El Nino event, but nothing. It was a total dud. This year, there's more reason to believe that El Nino will actually unfold the way that it's predicted to. 
But there's also a reason to withhold our, yeah, our judgment on whether or not we're right, because two things. It's not a phenomenon that we completely understand, just like we don't fully understand Godzilla. Um, and I, you know, I don't care what Matthew Broderick says. We don't. Um, but the, the other thing, we don't fully understand El Nino. We don't understand El Nino during climate change because we haven't experienced very much El Nino during climate change. Well, the one El Nino I remember was The huge one. Right, so there is some risk of a wetter winter, which in the Northeast means bigger, big winter storms. There's some limited risk. But I am very reluctant to make a quantitative statement uh, about those kinds of risks because we could be right at the threshold where it's just sort of warm and wet. And it's, or, yeah, I mean, if you look at a historical perspective, there could be big storms that are slightly cooler right on the other side of being cool and you, see, you have huge damage yeah and can you attribute it to el nino i mean yeah kind of but i remember last year the prediction for the el nino coming up yep and then this past year it was total dud really cold and lots of snow yep yep great. yep no it was a good year for us <laughs> compared to other parts of the country but yeah um that's the state of the science. Sorry, I wish I, I wish I could sell you some awesome product that, you know, said we have a, we figured out a way to do seasonal prediction meaningfully and skillfully um, on three to nine month time scales. But we're not. We, we're just not there. Uh, we're working on it. I think part of the problem is that we're targeting the wrong variables. We're targeting the averages in ways that climatologists like to think about the averages. We're not targeting the thresholds, and that might be more relevant for agriculture. It might also be more potentially predictable because you're getting some of that information for free just from the annual climatological progression of the seasons. Right? The days are normally just getting longer, and it's just getting warmer as you move from January through April. Um, so that might be part of what we need to do. We need to look at what thresholds are most critical. We might need to also start thinking about more creative ways of post-processing the data rather than looking at um, simple metrics of reliability. Some models might be better than others, and maybe you're the community that can help us with that. Crowdsourcing model validation is a, is a very new, virtually under, unexplored territory for climate science. But it could be that some models are just better in some regions, and it's the growers and the farmers and the producers that are going to be able to tell us that. that no, 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 the, the, the NCAR model, your model, Toby, is crap, but this other one from NASA is great for Pennsylvania or for New, upstate New York. And we just we haven't done all the research needed to say which of them is best and how to do the, the post-processing to make better inference from the data sets that we have. This is sort of the, you know, the key challenge of the era of big data. We've got more data than we can make meaningful inferences from. So just to summarize, that was my five minute, right? That, okay. So just to summarize, this is new technology. Um, not everyone knows about these, so I wanted to make sure I mentioned them explicitly. There is a NOAA Seasonal Outlook tool. It gives you, I would say, a qualitative look at the likely anomalies for the fall, for the, for the coming season. It usually goes on two weeks to the nine months. There's this thing, which is really cutting edge, very exciting, but very underdeveloped in terms of its um, user interface. So it's the North American Multimodal Ensemble, an enemy. It sounds like enemy. It's not my enemy. It's not our enemy. It's our friend, an enemy. Um, prediction for this winter, we have high confidence that there's going to be an El Nino. Now, I had high confidence in 2013 that there's going to be an El Nino, or 2014 there's going to be an El Nino. I told all my students in tropical meteorology. And we were right. It was an El Nino. So, you know, scientists won. Check, right? We got a point for being right. It was an El Nino, technically. But as far as the impacts, it didn't look at all like El Nino. Uh, we have more confidence, even more, even more confidence now in El Nino. Warm fall, medium confidence, and wetter. And now whether that wetness means snow or rain, first of all, it's very low confidence. And second of all, it's to be determined. It's a work in progress. Um, then the last thing. 
that will be coming online soon. We do a spring casting campaign, trying to predict the timing of spring. And uh, like I was mentioning before, trying to get at impacts. So that's all I got. Thank you.